Hi, welcome to Yovi's home. If you don't know, before I had kids and I worked on YouTube, I had a job and I worked in international criminal law. And so like many, many people, I am completely fascinated by true crime stories and I love listening to true crime podcasts. Lately, I have become completely obsessed with Bailey Sarian on YouTube who does this murder, makeup, mystery Mondays where she talks about a true crime story on her channel that interests her. And so today we are going to try to do something similar, but we're going to talk about crimes that were either perpetrated in the Netherlands or the criminals were Dutch or there is some kind of connection to the Netherlands. Um, let me know what you're most interested in and maybe we can make this an ongoing series. Today, my friends, we are going to be talking about one of the most famous crimes in Dutch history the 1983 kidnapping of Freddie Heineken. This kidnapping resulted in one of the world's largest ever known ransom payments, like 35 million Dutch guilders, which to the best of my ability is something between 15 to 30 million euro in today's money. It was demanded in four currencies and paid out in cash. And when it was paid out, it weighed over 200 pounds. This story is full of history and intrigue. So if that sounds good to you, then why don't you come on in, put on your detective hat and stay a while. Let's solve some crimes together. The Dutch word of the day today is beer, and that means beer. <laughs> now, before we jump into the kidnapping itself, we have to cover some historical stuff. Stay with me because this stuff is important. The story of Heineken beer began on February 15, 1864, when Gerard Adrian Heineken took over the Haystack Brewery in Amsterdam. Gerard was a fantastic entrepreneur and slowly his beer became famous in the Netherlands and then eventually internationally. By 1889, his beer won the prestigious Grand Prix at the Paris Expo and one year later began supplying the restaurant at the Eiffel Tower. In 1933, after prohibition was lifted in the US, it became the first imported beer into the United States. Eventually, 40% of all imported beer in the US was Heineken. So basically, the company is doing well, growing, and making that money. But this isn't a story about Gerard, nor is it a story about his son, Henry. No, this is the story of Freddie Heineken, who was Gerard, Gerard's grandson. Freddie took over from his father as chairman of the executive board of Heineken in 1971. And his influence was felt in every facet of the company, from the production to sales and marketing, even to the design of the iconic green bottle. His leadership oversaw a period of extraordinary innovation and energetic expan expansion as he built a global brand. Well, guess what comes with all of that growth and success? Money. A lot of money. And that didn't go unnoticed. Switching gears, I want to talk about Willem Holader, who I will refer to as Wim in this video. Now, Wim was born in May of 1958, and he is the oldest of four kids. He grew up in the Jordan neighborhood in Amsterdam. Wim's father, he worked at the Heineken Brewery and he like revered his boss, the big shot Freddie Heineken. Now picture this, when Wim was young, he and his siblings did all their homework with like Heineken logoed pens and they drank milk from Heineken logo glasses. Like literally their house was drenched in Heineken. Um, as was their father, who was a complete alcoholic. And he was also a tyrannical sadist who like belittled and abused his wife and children. I mean, including Wim. From there, er Wim's early forays into the criminal underworld were modest. So he provided like muscle for landlords looking to evict squatters and he dabbled in some like various fraudulent schemes. But by his early 20s, he had advanced to armed robbery. Wim's best friend from childhood was a guy called Cornelius Van Hout, um, and we will call him Cor. Now Cor had like a joie de vivre, and he didn't take Wim too seriously, and basically the two of them were like a super team. Cor would eventually become Wim's brother-in-law, but also the mastermind behind the Heineken kidnapping. There are three other names that you should know before we continue this story, and those names are Franz Meyer, Martin Erkamps, and Jan Boleart. Together with women core, these five men planned and executed the kidnapping that we are talking about today. Now, 
Core said that when they were planning the kidnapping, the men established like a few key principles. First, the entire job had to have a grand slam. It needed to set them up for life. Next, when choosing the victim, it had to be someone for whom a high ransom could be paid quickly. He had to be very, very rich, but he couldn't be either a royal or a politician. Some others who were considered as possible kidnappees included the CEO of Philips at the time, as well as Mr. Albert Hein. And ultimately, the gang chose Freddie Heineken and their plan was set in motion. You guys, a job of this magnitude needed preparation time and like considerable investment before it could be carried out. So the team spent two years <laughs> and 100,000 guilders or like 45,000 in today's money um, in preparation for it. In short, the plan was kidnap Freddie, take him to a secure location, demand and receive the ransom, and let him go within two days. It did not go like that, but let's, let's not get ahead of ourselves and let's just go back to the planning. One of the five men had access to a Romney hut with a construction workers workshop in Amsterdam Harbor. The men got to work with making this hut and customizing it for their needs. So first, they built a false wall and a secret door. Now behind the wall, they soundproofed it and they split the, cell, the, the space into two separate cells. Keep in mind that during the day, this hut was used as a workshop for like construction workers, but you guys, no one noticed. No one noticed that suddenly it was 12 feet shorter than before. During the kidnapping, um, Heineken and Dodor would eventually be locked in these cells and people walked in and out of the workplace during working hours without anyone noticing anything unusual. Obviously then the team would end up bringing like food and stuff and like care for their victims like during the evenings and weekends like when the construction workers were gone. But like can you imagine what that would be like? Like it just it blows my mind to think that people were just like walking in and out of the hut like and nobody suspected a damn thing. Like. What other secrets like exist in plain sight? On November 9th, 1983, Freddie Heineken left his office in Amsterdam, expecting to be greeted by his like long serving chauffeur, a man called Ab Doderer. But instead he was confronted by men at gunpoint. After a brief scuffle, they bundled both Ab Doderer and Heineken into a van. Now these guys were handcuffed in the back and like their eyes were covered so they could not see where they were going. Now Heineken's not a dumb guy, right? Like he immediately knew what was going on and he offered to just write the man a check while he was still in the van. Like, hey guys, don't kidnap me, I'll just pay you. But mm, they did not respond to this. Now, as this was happening, like a taxi driver had seen the struggle in front of the office and he decided, I'm gonna be a hero. I'm gonna follow this van through Amsterdam. Eventually they arrived at a bicycle tunnel where the kidnappers had removed the poles that like blocked the tunnel from cars. Um, and then this is where they then switched from the van into two cars. Now remember this ballsy ass taxi driver? Well, he was a lot less brave when during this like period of moving cars and stuff, Wim walked at him with like a gun pointing at him. Um, now, this taxi driver was not only brave, but smart too. He immediately fled, immediately was like, peace, bye guys, I'm out of here. This is not, uh, mm -mm, this is not worth it. And therefore, the Wim and the team, they just like made their way back to Amsterdam Harbor with their victims and yeah, put them in the hut. Now the two hostages, they were stripped of their clothes and all of their belongings. They were given pajamas to wear and they were put inside the two rooms that they had prepared. They were completely isolated from the outside world and also from each other. The five kidnappers then returned to their normal routines like in order to avoid raising suspicion of family and friends before they then went on to make some ransom demands. Now, as I mentioned, the original plan was to keep Heineken for only two days, but it ended up being 21 days, um, in part because of the media attention that surrounded this case. It was a fantastic case. The media had made like the ransom drops like very complicated and you know lengthened the whole ordeal. Thanks, media. <laughs> but in that time, Heineken 
totally butted heads with the gang like over food and conditions like he did not like the food that they were serving and he made demands for like fancy shiz like consomme and other delicacies but like can you imagine like it's just so crazy to me to think about that like he must have known that these guys would never kill him so he felt totally comfortable just like making all kinds of demands for how he wanted to be treated during his confinement. During his confinement, Heineken really showed his strength of character though, like in trying to keep busy and he would like do exercises during the day and he was allowed brief chats with his driver. They were allowed to see each other for a few minutes each day um, and he would just like chat with him, you know? Heineken even said that in the morning, like he and Dodor would be given four slices of bread each and they would always just set aside one slice in case they didn't get more food um, during, you know, the evening. But the crew made sure to bring a warm meal to their prisoners every night. Now, obviously, Women Corps and the rest of the team did not abduct Heineken for fun. They were after some serious money. As far as the ransom goes, the kidnappers had studied really famous kidnappings before, like Getty or like Limber. And these guys decided that they would have an equally elaborate plan for the handover of the ransom. The gang first made contact with the police by dropping in an envelope with Heineken's watch, Dodor's papers, and a ransom note to a small police station. With the ransom, this was like a really tricky situation. Since the ransom was so enormous and it was demanded in cash, the man had to figure out how to move that money without getting caught. So first they thought, ah, let's let's use like a pneumatic, 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 tube transport that way they could stay like a reasonable distance away while still receiving the money like however while they were testing out their plan they realized that it entailed a lot of risks and it was just too difficult to achieve so then another option was to get the money thrown into the water by negotiators so that the kidnappers collect it could collect it like using diving equipment but the bag would weigh like at least 800 pounds in total which was just impossible to move in the end, police were ordered to signal that the ransom was ready with an advertisement in the personal section of a Dutch newspaper that read, the meadow is green for the hair. And so you guys, this plan was almost perfect, but it was foiled by events outside the control of the gang or the police, which was the media. First had demanded that an unarmed police officer carry the ransom in a you know slightly marked van from Heineken's home. But like reporters had also seen the the meadow was green for the hair and they were surrounding the property it really made it impossible they were also following the van so then the kidnappers were just like nope nope abandon ship this is not how it's gonna go today days of silence followed before the gang and the negotiators like re-established contact through again coded newspaper advertisements finally they decided to direct the police via like a recorded message to the first of a series of other buried messages that would lead detectives like on a trail throughout the Netherlands. This second ransom exchange went ahead um, as concerns about the safety of the hostages grew. Like it had already been three weeks, you know? The Heineken family handed the police driver five sacks containing the ransom money in four different currencies, just as the kidnappers had requested. The driver followed all the messages and did all the things, ultimately depositing the sacks in a storm drain in Utrecht. Now, exactly according to the plan, the five mailbags then slid through the storm drain and landed onto the flatbed of a waiting pickup truck, and the crew escaped unobserved. The police had planned to track the money with a night vision camera on a helicopter, but again, technical failure, <laughs> and this did not happen. Heineken and Dodor were not released right away, but shortly thereafter, the police received an anonymous tip um, that led the SWAT team to the shed in this harbor. Um, and this happened on November 30th. Now, at first, police thought that they were misled, but Eventually, the police saw that there was more behind that wall, and then they eventually found the secret door, and Heineken and Dodor were finally freed. Um, once again, back to Heineken's character, like, can you imagine when he was just like, saw the police and was like, could you not have come a bit earlier? Apparently that's what he told them. Now, I know what you're wondering, like, what happened to the five kidnappers? It's a good question. Well, on the night that they received the ransom, 
they drove to a wooded area southeast of Amsterdam where they hid like 75% of the ransom in, bar in barrels that they then buried. And in a characteristically Dutch twist, they then made their getaway on bicycles. <laughs> The day after the ransom exchange, the gang spotted that they were under police surveillance, so they arranged a meeting to discuss their plans. They were divided on whether to flee the Netherlands or stay. Ultimately, Mayor Ballard and Aircoms, they decided to stay put, and Cor and Wim, they opted to flee to Paris. Jan Ballard was eventually sentenced to 12 years in prison for his part in the kidnapping. Franz Meyer, he handed himself over to police after claiming to have burned his share of the ransom on a beach. It's important. Martin Erkamps, who was just 21 at the time of the kidnapping, he was sentenced to nine years in prison for his involvement. Now, Cor and Wim, they would remain on the run until they were discovered uh, in France. The legal extradition process took about three years, and while the extradition process took place, Women Corps gave like the occasional interview to Dutch media, and in those interviews, they came across as insolent and dashing anti-heroes, like working class tough guys who'd dared to kidnap a rich plutocrat. Women Corps were finally extradited to the Netherlands in 1986, and they were sentenced to 11 years in prison. Under the Netherlands' liberal sentencing regime, though, they were only released after five years. The Dutch public was completely scandalized when the kidnappers marked the occasion by throwing a really decadent party at which a band performed, you guys, the Heineken Jingle. But what happened to the money, you ask? Yes, yes, I hear you. I hear you asking through your screen. Well, do you remember that I told you that they had hidden the money and like buried it in these barrels and stuff? Well, before they separated, the gang took about one quarter or 25% of the money with them and hid the rest before, you know, they tried to escape and shit. But the buried money was discovered very quickly by some people who were going out for a walk around this town of Zeist. And so 75% of the ransom was given back to the police and presumably to the Heineken family. Now, according to Wim's sister, Wim and Cor had entrusted some of these missing or burned funds to their criminal associates with instructions to invest it in the drug trade. So while Wim and Cor were in prison, this money was working for them. Wim's sister once said, they went into prison as rich men, but came out even richer. They would eventually go on to become some of the most fearsome gangsters in the Netherlands, like going in and out of jail for many, many years. One sector in which Wim and Cor invested the ransom money was in the sex trade. They eventually acquired interest in like several prominent establishments in Amsterdam's red light district. Their names, of course, were not on any of the official paperwork because the, uh, their investments were made through like proxies, you know? And legally speaking, there was no Heineken money because it all burned on a beach. When people asked Wim what had happened to the missing money and the millions, he again referred people that they burned the money on a beach. Waar is het geld? Het geld dat heeft volgens mij verbrand op het strand, hè? Really? Really? All that work just to burn it? Women Corps' involvement in the red light businesses, I guess, they became an open secret in Amsterdam. After they invested in the Casa Rosso, which is a venue famed for its erotic theater, um, the Heineken company reportedly informed the management that its beer could no longer be sold there. So interesting. The Heineken family, they never attempted to recover the remaining 25% um, by pursuing legal action against Cor and Wim. Heineken was traumatized by the kidnapping and he was fearful that these, you know, criminal entrepreneurs might strike again. Now, Heineken was a rich man and he just wanted to live in peace. He was like, just people, just leave me alone. In the early 90s, Women Corps actually sat down with Heineken's head of security and they told him like, Freddie does not need to be afraid. This promise was given kind of with like an implicit expectation, you know, that Heineken in spirit of reciprocity, he would not attempt to get his money back. Um, after the kidnapping, Heineken became something of a recluse, but 
he went on to live like a long life and he died in 2002 at the age of 78 um, from pneumonia. Women Corps would continue their lives in the criminal underworld. Um, one day in January 2003, Corps was chatting with an associate outside of a Chinese restaurant when two men drove up on a red motorcycle and opened fire, uh, killing him. After his best friend was murdered, Wim appeared to consolidate his own authority in the criminal underworld. One by one, his criminal associates were also killed. He was never explicitly connected to any of these murders, but they were a bit like the Heineken money. You know, nobody could prove anything, but everyone assumed that Wim was behind all of these crimes. In 2007, Wim was convicted of blackmailing several businessmen in Amsterdam, and he was sent to prison. On his release five years later, he became even more famous in the Netherlands than like ever before. He took to riding like a Vespa around the fashionable districts of Amsterdam. He even recorded, you guys, a hip hop single, William is terug, or William is back, with like a Dutch rapper called Lange France, and included lyrics like, I was imprisoned like an animal and released as a man. He began writing like a pretty boastful column in the magazine, The New Review, um, name dropping famous acquaintances and suggesting that like, now that he was a writer, he'd be embraced by the journalists who have, you know, like always written dirt about him. He engaged a personal paparazzo to compile images of him fraternizing with celebrities and books and books about his criminal exploits like were published like Holader, the early years and like they really became incredibly famous a film was even made about the heineken kidnapping with no uh, no one other than anthony hopkins playing the part of freddie um wim even went on to appear on like the college tour a dutch uh, a popular dutch television show that featured interviews with notable figures like bill gates and archbishop desmond tutu um the press <laughs> ultimately started describing Wim as a knuffle criminal or the huggable criminal. When young people in Amsterdam saw him out on the town, they would like ask him for selfies. One local mob boss like even joked that Wim Holader was the Netherlands' like best known product since cheese. Think about that. Like ultimately it would be Wim's sisters who would eventually wear a wire and testify against their brother. In December 2014, Wim was arrested and charged with the murder of more associates. Um, and since then, he has actually been arrested a few more times while in prison for various other murders. Because of the horrors revealed by his sisters at trial, Wim lost the huggable criminal title. So there you have it, you guys. This is the story of the Heineken kidnapping that has literally spanned my entire lifetime. Um, I hope that you enjoyed this video. Let me know what you think and if you would like to see more of this type of video on my channel. It would be really, really fun to make this like an ongoing monthly series or something, so do let me know if you enjoyed it. Thank you so, so much for coming over today and solving this case with me. I really appreciate it and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Doei!